Tuck Everlasting, Chapter 12 The sky was a ragged blaze of red and pink and orange, and its double trembled on the surface of the pond like color spilled from a paint box. The sun was dropping fast now, a soft red sliding egg yolk, and already to the east there was a darkening to purple. Winnie, newly brave with her thoughts of being rescued, climbed boldly into the rowboat. The hard heels of her button boots made a hollow banging sound against its wet boards, loud in the warm and breathless quiet. Across the pond, a bullfrog spoke a deep note of warning. Tuck climbed in too, pushing off and settling the oars into their locks, dipped them into the silty bottom in one strong pull. The rowboat slipped from the bank then, silently, and glided out, tall water grasses whispering away from its sides, releasing it. Here and there, the still surface of the water dimpled, and bright rings spread noiselessly and vanished. Feeding time, said Tuck softly. And Winnie, looking down, saw hosts of tiny insects skittering and skating on the surface. Best time of all for fishing, he said, when they come up to feed. He dragged on the oars. The rowboat slowed and began to drift gently toward the farthest end of the pond. It was so quiet that Winnie almost jumped when the bullfrog spoke again. And then, from the tall pines and birches that ringed the pond, a wood thrush caroled. The silver notes were pure and clear and lovely. "'Know what that is all around us, Winnie?' said Tuck, his voice low. "'Life. Moving, growing, changing, never the same, two minutes together. "'This water, you look out at it every morning, and it looks the same, but it ain't. "'All night long it's been moving, coming in through the stream back there to the west, "'slipping out through the stream down east here. "'Always quiet, always new, moving on. "'You can't hardly see the currents, can you?' and sometimes the wind makes it look like it's going the other way. But it's always there. The water's always moving on. And some day, after a long while, it comes to the ocean. They drifted in silence for a time. The bullfrog spoke again, and from behind them, far back in some reedy secret place, another bullfrog answered. In the fading light, the trees along the banks were slowly losing their dimensions, flat flattening into silhouettes, clipped from black paper and pasted to the paling sky. The voice of a different frog, hoarser and not so deep, croaked from the nearest bank. "'Know what happens then?' said Tuck. "'To the water. The sun sucks some of it up right out of the ocean and carries it back in clouds. And then it rains, and the rains fall into the stream, and the stream keeps moving on, taking it all back again. It's a wheel, Winnie. Everything's a wheel, turning and turning, never stopping. The frogs is part of it, and the bugs, and the fish, and the wood thrush, too. And people, but never the same ones. Always coming in new, always growing and changing, and always moving on. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it is. The rowboat had drifted at last to the end of the pond, but now its bow bumped into the rotting branches of a fallen tree that that thrust thick fingers into the water. And though the current pulled at it, dragging its stern sidewise, the boat was wedged and could not follow. The water slipped past it, out between clumps of reeds and brambles, and gurgled down a narrow bed, over stones and pebbles, foaming a little, moving swiftly now after its slow trip between the pond's wide banks. And farther down, Winnie could see it hurried into a curve, around a leaning willow, and disappeared. It goes on, Tuck repeated, to the ocean. But this rowboat now, it's stuck. If we didn't move it ourselves, it would stay here forever trying to get loose but stuck. That's what us Tucks are, Winnie. Stuck so as we can't move on. We ain't part of the wheel no more. Dropped off, Winnie, left behind. And everywhere around us, things is moving and growing and changing. You, for instance, a child now, but someday a woman. And after that, moving on to make room for the new children. Winnie blinked, and all at once her mind was drowned with understanding of what he was saying. For she, yes, even she, would go out of the world willy-nilly some day. Just go out, like the flame of a candle, and no use protesting. It was a certainty. She would try very hard not to think of it, but sometimes, as now, it would be forced upon her. She raged against it, helpless and insulted, and blurted at last, I don't want to die. No, said Tuck calmly. Not now. Your time's not now. But dying's part of the wheel. Right there next to being born. 
You can't pick out the pieces you like and leave the rest. Being part of the whole thing, that's the blessing. But it's passing us by, us Tux. Living's heavy work. But off to one side, the way we are, it's useless, too. It don't make sense. If I knowed how to climb back up on that wheel, I'd do it in a minute. You can't have living without dying. So you can't call it living what we got. We just are. We just be, like rocks beside the road. Tuck's voice was rough now, and Winnie, amazed, sat rigid. No one had ever talked to her of things like this before. I want to grow again, he said fiercely, and change. If that means I gotta move on at the end of it, then I want that too. Listen, Winnie, it's something you don't find out how you feel until afterwards. If people knowed about that spring down there in Tree Gap, they'd all come running like pigs to slops. They'd trample each other trying to get some of that water. That'd be bad enough, but afterwards, could you imagine? All the little ones little forever. All the old ones old forever. Can you picture what that means? Forever? The wheel would keep on going round, the water roll into the ocean, but the people would have turned into nothing but rocks on the side of the road, because they wouldn't know till after. And then, it'd be too late. He peered at her, and when he saw that his face was pinched with the effort of explaining, Do you see now, child? Do you understand? Oh, well, Lord, I just got to make you understand. There was a long, long moment of silence. Winnie, struggling with the anguish of all these things, could only sit hunched and numb, the sound of the water rolling in her ears. It was black and silky now. It lapped at the sides of the rowboat and hurried on around them into the stream. And then, down the length of the pond, a voice rang out. It was Miles, and every word across the water came clearly to their ears. Pa! Pa, come back! Something's happened, Pa! The horse is gone. Can you hear me? Someone stole the horse.